Am I in the right orientation? Somebody tell me if I'm in the right orientation. Super chat. Uh, live chat. There we go. Guys, am I in the right orientation? How is my sound doing? Everybody let me know if that is okay or if I have to go this way. I think I got to go this way. We'll figure it out. Um, hello, this is Mark Wildman of Wildman Athletica, and we are doing our live as we do every Thursday now. And we are just making all of our stuff come online. Excellent. <clears throat> so let's get started with some topics, uh, hands. Uh, we've had some comments about hands recently. Howdy, Dale. Dale, how is my sound? Are we doing good with sound? Hello from Poland. We finally got some Europeans. Uh, greetings, hope all is well, Zach Brecker. Sound is fine to you. Okay, good. Uh, sound is good, sound is good, sound is good. All right, seems like the sound is good. Um, so let's start talking quickly about hands. We've had some people comment that their hands hurt from several things, uh, from maces and from like heavy kettlebell pullover sit-ups. Um, that was a question I got this morning and I thought it was worth kicking off with. Heavy pullover sit-ups, uh, globe on top, heavy side on top, lay down on the ground, pull all the way over. People are having trouble with the top of their hands. This is something that most people don't realize, but the top of people's hands, most of them don't work very well in the beginning, especially if you live in the modern world and you didn't grow up on a farm or grow up as a carpenter or something. Usually people have one good hand, their dominant hand, and they can close the top of their hand very tight. Usually their left hand doesn't close as tight and weights will rock around in the web of their hand and cause bruising and cause uh, big rubs inside their hand. So one of the first things that we see when we start coaching people in heavy club swinging and mace is that people will close their hand like this and you'll be able to see it immediately. You'll see the top knuckle stand out from the grip and you can see it from 20 feet away. So when I'm coaching a group of people, I will look at everybody's hand. Usually people have one good hand and one bad hand. If this is what's happening when you look at your hand, you are not closing the top of your hand all the way yet and the weights will rock around and bruise and beat up your hands very much. I have huge calluses on the palm of both hands and that's from years of clubbing. One of the reasons that we start with something like single arm clubbing, usually instead of mace, you can start with, you can start with whichever one you have access to. But if you were to walk into my gym, everybody would start with single arm club because it would allow me to see how well their hands function, specifically this top part of their hand. So part of the reason that we start with, hello from Brazil, hi to Brazil, uh, inside circle and outside circle and shield cast is because we are getting people to work on closing the top of their hand. There's two types of grip in every type of single and or mace movement. Uh, I'm gonna steal some phrases from a bunch of different coaches. We call it ice cream cone grip, where your grip is dominated by the bottom two fingers of your hand. And that is the grip when you're swinging across the bottom of an inside circle and outside circle mill or reverse mill of pendulum. That is the grip. When you go across the top part of the circle and you catch, the reason we start with the base first is that deceleration is going to encourage people to learn to close their hands all the way because most people are not closing their hand all the way and it's bouncing around in their hand. That also happens with very strong athletes in the beginning because their muscles are very strong, um, but they're not used to that deceleration grip. The grip in club and mace and just using hammers or pickaxes or whatever is very specific and it's slightly different for each thing. Club and mace are very much the same. It's a little bit different than something like actual sword grip. Actual sword grip, there's a bunch of different ways you can do it, but the fundamentals are always the same. Ice cream cone, okay. 
That okay part is the part that people miss. So the reason we encourage people to stay with lightweights for six months to a year and run lots of different cycles with a lightweight is specifically about this, the hand, closing all the way as you decelerate the weight and come to a stop. If your knuckle is sticking out and you try to go up in weight, as you decelerate, the club is gonna push into the top of your hand and it is going to eat it up. It'll absolutely destroy it. Uh, there are many people who have very good grip in something like pull-ups or bar, aerial bar or trapeze, but that grip is different. That's what we call the monkey grip, where you're pulling against the grip. You're pulling against the fingers themselves. Clubs and mace uh, pull through your grip. They're trying to pull out. As you accelerate the weight, you're squeezing with the bottom part of your hand. As you come to the stop, you're squeezing with the top part of your hand. So think about those as being kind of the main grips that we want to work on. That monkey grip, which is what people start with in kettlebelling, start, not end, start, and then the ice cream cone and okay grip in club and mace. Uh, you eventually get to the ice cream cone grip and the okay grip in kettlebell once you push the duration of sets up higher and longer. You know, and there's all kinds of other grip out there as well. You know, rope climbing grip, which pulls through your hand once again instead of against your hand. Um, that's the one that I've practiced for years doing, uh, you know, circus rope and hammock. Uh, I was never a great trapeze guy pulled through my grip. I never just, just didn't have enough time to train that, all that stuff. Um, and then something like rings has even a different grip, that false edge grip, uh, at which I am totally terrible because I never have a place or a chance to practice that. Um, side note, there is a really fun version of what you might think of as rings. Um, circus Roman rings, which are like rings with more complexity, but you need a 30 foot ceiling at least you know 40 would be better so you can really swing it um and straps which can actually be trained static and that is a wrap grip around your arms uh, that one is super fun uh but once again you need a high point especially for somebody my size in order to be able to learn something like that um focus on light mace light club run those volume cycles run those density cycles stay with a low weight for six months before you start doing heavy lights and that will improve the odds of your hands surviving. People say that it feels like they're getting tendonitis in their thumb. That means that they are not decelerating the weight all the way and squeezing with the top of their hand. Okay, uh, intro chat done. Let's go up here to start at the top and look at some questions. Hello from Poland, Poland. Uh, Zach Racker, he's always commenting on this. Sounds good, sound is good, excellent. Uh, Tim Stapleton says, thank you for the videos and knowledge. Sure. I wish somebody had given me all of this, this stuff when, I, you know, I was young. Nobody told me any of this stuff. I spent about $80,000 on seminars and instructor trainings over the course of 15 years to amass this knowledge. And I'm one of the guys who kind of went everywhere. So between circus and martial arts, Krav Maga, Kung Fu, um, never did a lot of MMA, but some MMA stuff, so I understand the concepts. You know, weapons, Japanese weapons, Chinese weapons. I did some European weapons, but I find that things like long sword are like very similar to like Japanese sword, and HEMA people will freak out over that, but they are fundamentally similar. At the high levels, everything is different. Um, kettlebells, I think I had like five certifications I spent time studying for and training for. Club, mace. Uh, all these different things. I wish that somebody had told me this information because it would have saved me years of my life and it would have made my entire life, you know, better, just better. You know, when you, uh, when you grow up in the middle of nowhere and you don't have resources, granted back when I grew up, there was nothing like YouTube, but I do think it is a good thing to make videos and talk to people about this stuff because I think it might make the world a better place. I mean, if it does, it would be great. If it doesn't, it's fun. Um, the, one of the first books, the only book that I, I had growing up was Bruce Lee's Art of the Human Body, which I got at a Walden bookstore in Lima, Ohio. And it actually mentions kettlebells in that book when it talks about hip training and deadlift. 
I don't remember the page number, but the word kettlebell is in there. And I read over it for years and I had no idea what it meant, but we didn't have Google back then, you know, or internet. Well, you know, I didn't have internet when I was young. I didn't have internet till I went to USC. Um, and I didn't really understand the value of the internet until 2010. Uh, you know, I went to USC and it was all research and you were just using the internet to do research and all this other stuff. Um, but I don't even know when YouTube became a big thing. I started watching it in maybe 2008 and I was watching almost exclusively Dave Canterbury's videos, Dave Canterbury of the Pathfinder School and Self-Reliance Outfitters. Obviously you'll hear a lot of the stuff I say sounds like the stuff that Dave says. We talk about different topics entirely, but the way that that guy coaches and explains thing is one of the main models for the way that I try to communicate information on YouTube, small videos every day about really small nerdy topics that you know other people wouldn't deign, deign to make videos about. Um, but yeah, uh, I make videos so that you guys can learn. If everybody learns, we all get better. Hello from Brazil. I'd love to go to Brazil. I was supposed to go to Brazil for a movie premiere, um, but we didn't have time. We didn't want to fly from Romania to Brazil like in two days. It would have just been crazy, but I was, I was upset we didn't get to go. I obviously didn't get to make that decision. That was production. Hello from the Ukraine. Boom, SS. Hmm, my, I think that's a 5.5 five maybe. I don't know what that is. Uh, might not want to have it be that. Um, but yeah, hello Ukraine. Dan Elisalde. Uh, Dan, see, I think I wrote Don on your video that I did today about you. Was that today? Did I put that up today? I don't know. Uh, London, John Boy. Hey, hey, everybody from London, love it. Loud and clear, Germany. All right, guys, throw me some questions here. Uh, Amy Chapel Nurnberg, 3.05 p.m. I've already lost track of time. Uh, flabby arms and lower abs, please. All right. Uh, I love no question. I just like the statement, flabby arms, lower abs. Um, flabby arms, everything we do. So in order to get rid of flabby, flabby arms, uh, two things you need to do. Number one, create tonus tension in your arms. You can say it a bunch of ways. Create tone is what people normally say when they walk into a gym. Um, flabby, I assume you're talking about hello Helens. When you wave, you have that like little wave down there. Um, the two things we need to talk about are creating tone, uh, which is all of kettlebells and clubs, and then lowering body fat, which is metabolic conditioning. Um, side effect is lower abs. Your whole core is trained no matter what when you do kettlebells and clubs. But if you want to specifically like work on lower abs and it would be something like hanging leg raises. Uh, and there's a bunch of versions of that. The easiest version is ab straps where they have this U of fabric. You put your elbows in, drive your elbows towards your hip bones, fire your lats, hang your body and pull your knees up to your elbows. That's kind of a classic. Uh, a lot of people might not be able to do that because that requires a place with a bar that they can do that on. So a lot of people you'll see do that in the gym. That's kind of a classic famous bodybuilder exercise. Um, everything's really all ab, but you can kind of think of that one as lower ab. Um, GHD kills most people because uh, most people don't have the hip flexibility to do it. But that is one of my favorite ab exercises. That's what I used to do back in college before I even knew what a GHD was. Uh, I think we used to call them something like, um, yeah, it was something like GHD. And we would do cycles of sit-ups all the way down, touch the ground, sit all the way up, touch your toes, set to 20, then do the side one, uh, side, each side 20, and then back extensions for 20. And I would just do that for like 20 minutes back in the day. Uh, that's a great core workout. Um, problem is with all of those things ghds are expensive and they're big they have a massive footprint um, so you tend to only find them in crossfit gyms and college or university athletic facilities uh, you almost never find them in like a conventional gym like a 24-hour fitness you know they might have one that's kind of like that weird slope version for back extension but they've changed the angle to try to keep people from getting hurt, but thus removing like 90% of the benefit of the exercise itself. 
Uh, GHDs are big and expensive. I mean, you're looking at the $500 to $1,000 range. I have no idea what a Rogue one costs now. I did see Bells of Steel has a super cool one that I kind of am lusting after. I think it was $600. It was a GHD and a back hyper extension combo. So sweet. I don't have anywhere to put it. I suppose I could throw it in the barn upstairs or something, but I don't know. <clears throat> Uh, hey, it's the wrong orientation, LOL. See, somebody tell me that, okay. Orientation is locked, rotate device back. It said, um, guys, tell me is my orientation right or am I sideways? Somebody jump in, tell me that. I'm gonna wait until somebody tells me that. Uh, you good. Okay, I'm good, okay. Let's get back up here. So oh, at flabby arms and lower abs. Everything you do in club in mace is arms. You will create tone no matter what. Then you need to lower your body fat. That's metabolic conditioning, which is usually time under tension protocols, which we have a lot of, which are you know 60, 60s, 30, 30s, 20, 10s, 90, 30s, 90 seconds of work, 30 seconds of break. That one's just mean. Um, and you would do different metabolic profiles or different metabolic formats every day. Uh, maybe we'll make a big program with that. Um, that was gonna be part of our more advanced exercises for overweight individuals program, but you know, I need another editor to get that one out. It's half shot. Dale Everdale, my feet, arches didn't work either. I think you guys are talking to each other at that point. Um, Steve Laviette TV. La mm. He plays hockey, and then he gets tired. He doesn't know if it's his cardio or leg muscle fatigue. Um, hockey's insanely difficult, so that could be either. Also works construction. Okay, that will beat the crap out of you. And he wants to train for a long cycle competition. Boy, this guy's just doing it all. Uh, he's always uh, exhausted. How do you balance this? Um, Steve, that is going to be a lot of work. You are not going to be doing long kettlebell workouts with the amount of other stuff you're doing. I would encourage you to stick to 10 to 15 minutes at a time of kettlebell work. Um, and uh, as you're training for a long cycle competition, uh, you're going to be training in that 10 sets to 20 minutes where they have like, uh, depends on who's training you're following, but like where you do one minute of work, two minute break, two minutes of work, two minute break. There's a bunch of different formats for long cycle training, but keep it low. And uh, with that much activity, diet is going to play a huge deal. You know, I would say eat a lot of steak and um you know at least a pound of red meat a day with that amount of work a pound probably a pound and a half with that amount of work depending on your body size um steve write that to me in a different thing and maybe we can talk about that in its own separate video because i should sit down and make a much more thought out idea and tell me like what type of construction it is how often you're playing hockey and all those other things uh, there's a lot of stuff that could be a variable in there to keep you from getting exhausted. But granted, if you play hockey a lot, you will be exhausted because hockey is super hard. Uh, what 8X device do you recommend for a person to start with, arc or club? Uh, I would start, I tend to tell people to start with club. Um, and I tell people to start with one. Uh, double club stuff is like year three. Single club will keep you going until you get your starting weight, 10 to 15 pounds, and you need to get to at least single arm 25. Um, if you could get, instead of two club handles, get one club handle and one arc handle, that would be a better thing, but that is an economic consideration. But most valuable on that list for 90% of the population is going to be single arm club. You can do the same thing with arc, but it's going to require you to know where your hand is repeatedly on the arc handle. So the arc handle is long, 
The club handle is short. The point of the club handle is your hand can always sit at the bottom of the club handle on the knob, so you always repeat the same length every time you change hands in your set. And you should be changing hands every five reps for the first, you know, three years. Every five to 10 reps, if volume cycle, five reps. Density cycle uh, gets you to 10 reps. Uh, arc, you can do it, but if you catch in a different position each time, a different length down from the top, it will change the length of the lever and that changes the way that it impacts your hand. Fine for an advanced athlete. Tends not to be great for a beginning athlete. Unless you can find a way to mark the arc handle. Uh, I used to with I used to train with sludge hammers before I knew about heavy clubs at all. And I marked distances down from the head with different colors of tape. And I would put different types of like friction tape on the handle uh, every three inches down so and they were different colors so that I could grab the same point every time when my hand touched the friction tape then I knew I was at the same length so if you were going to use an arc which would allow you to do something like mace 360s um, you would have to just mark the handle in some way that you can feel and do repeatedly over and over and over again uh, sorry, male person, and the dogs are freaking out. Um, so I usually tell people club because it reduces a variable that people have to think about. They just move their hand to the bottom of the club handle every time and repeat. Uh, that's the way I would tell people to do it. Uh, Johnny Scott, Mark, have you ever explored arm wrestling or other strongman contest? I am interested in heavy carrying as I work on a farm mostly. Well, then you're going to be really good at it. Um, I've never explored arm wrestling. There was that great uh, Stallone movie in the, I think it was the 80s or the 90s called Over the Top, where he just has uh, a little cable machine in his truck and he just trains one arm. Um, I love that movie. It's not a great movie at all. Uh, and if you did train like that, one arm would be super overdeveloped and probably wouldn't be good for anything else. Um, but I've never trained for that. I don't really know about that. I, I have so much stuff to do. I always dedicated myself to martial art in circus because Batman, Dick Grayson, you know? Um, but I would love to do strongman stuff. I always liked Highland Games. I had some friends compete in Highland Games, but I never had time to do it. Um, now that I'm back kind of in the Midwest, maybe I'll look it up. My, my buddy uh, a couple towns over used to do Highland Games, and I have a lot of kilts. I have kilts from Scotland, and I do wear summer kilts very often. Uh, custom kilt was my first kilt, I, a kilt I actually uh, made in a warehouse collective sewing room uh in la back in i don't know maybe 09 08 09 um for being out in the desert and doing art stuff out in the desert also fantastic for survival training out in the desert uh lightweight cotton kilt and then i steal an idea from eastern native tribes and i wear leggings with a pair of like desert boots leggings are basically pants with the uh, so if you took a pair of pants and you cut them off to make jean shorts, you keep the legs and you throw away the jean shorts. Um, and you tie them up underneath the kilt and you put bands around your knees to keep them from sliding down. Uh, if you're familiar with Eastern tribes or the French Indian War, this is exclusively what was worn by uh, both European settlers, uh, long hunters and the native tribes in the Eastern Part of the country i combine that with a kilt for my summer outfit uh with like an indiana jones brown button-up dress shirt that's totally fitted great outfit uh and you know a big hat um i would love to do strong strong uh strong man games if i ever got around to it um i'm thinking i would like to get into uh, I have a friend who does run and gun. This will not be popular with uh, many people. And if you don't like this topic, I'm, I don't know, don't listen to it. 
Uh, run and gun is like biathlon with running. It's forest running biathlon, um, which is a thing that I love. And that's been a sport kind of in the Midwest in like very obscure kind of farming culture for a very long time. Uh, a lot of guys still do the tomahawk. It's based on the old school like rendezvous games uh, that you saw in the 1700s into the early 1800s where guys would come together out of the back country in the wilderness and they would all come together to rendezvous they would all get together and trade and do things and uh like sell pelts and all this other stuff that used to happen that no longer happens in any way and they had games and the games were running shooting throwing tomahawk throwing knife and doing it all together um i that's what i want to get into uh, I have a buddy who does it and he's extremely good at it. And it's it's fun. It's running with an object in your hand. Um, Dan Ellisald prefers three guns or anything that involves transitions. Uh, running gun does involve transitions. Um, uh, I think it does. I don't know. Nobody tells me. They have orienteering. It's all kinds of cool stuff. Uh, is there a reason I don't have any videos on circuit training? Yeah, everybody else does circuit training. I figured I could get through about three years of just explaining basic techniques before I needed to talk about circuit training. Um, circuit training, I think, should be specific uh, to what you're doing. And most people try to jump right into circuit training without an understanding of the basic techniques that they need in order to do things. If you want to do circuit training the way that I do circuit training, you already have to be good at something like sandbag lifting or slam ball. You have to be good at kettlebells and you have to be good at clubs and you need to be good at mace all as separate skills. Most people, if they try to jump into circuit training, you have to lower the complexity or the specificity of the exercise in order to get people to survive it. You can do push-ups, burpees, and box jumps. And that works out great, but you've lowered the specificity of the exercises themselves to such a low level as to make them just torture uh, without them. If you're not already a good athlete, you don't end up a good athlete from doing it. Uh, a lot of other people talk about that, um, which is great. I love circuit training, been doing it for years. Uh, but the way that I organize circuit training, you need to be good at a bunch of basic skills first. So what I'm trying to do is get people really good at a bunch of basic skills individually. And I design programs to make people good at a bunch of weird little hyper small skills. And then we are going to combine them all together. That is uh, an idea that we're working on now called workout of the week. Um, and they're going to, we're going to try to lean them towards kettlebells and clubs and slam ball in the beginning, uh, and that will be circuit training and metabolic conditioning, but it's gonna be based on skills from programs that are already out. And then every time we release a new program, those skills will start to get rolled into, yeah, uh, knocking my thing over, uh, knocking, I'm knocking my camera over. They will start to get integrated into the workout of the week. Um, Dan Everdale. Don't tell everybody that, Dale. Dale says you're learning Kung Fu. And that is true. I am subtly trying to trick everybody into being Batman um, through a series of acquiring a bunch of specific skills in order so you have the foundation to survive something like Batman training. And then we will eventually get to just straight Batman training uh, or, or um, 007 training. Those were the two great you know, ideas I had in my youth. I had Batman and I had uh, 007 movies on repeat. Um, so that is what I'm trying to do to you guys. Uh, just so you guys know ahead of time, I, that is what's going on. Splinter set. Knees, knees, knees. I've got the old man left knee. I'm fairly strong and mobile until the weather changes and my knee stops working. Do you have any knee routines you use? I don't know if you guys have noticed this. Everything I do is a knee routine. Literally everything. The point of single arm clubs. It solves tons of problems, but that is how I rebuilt my left knee after I ripped my left knee in half. Foot stays flat on the ground, arch fires, ankle rotates, 
knee rotates, hip rotates. That is the foundation of everything we do. We will talk about some of, more, some of the more advanced knee stuff in the future. Um, step downs off of a low box is one of the main things I use, and I do those, say, maybe a six to eight inch box, not a huge height. You can use usually the height of a step in a residential uh, residential home if, you know, the home isn't from 1880 or something where they had those huge steps. Uh, small steps and just stepping down with your base foot flat, keeping your ankles flat on the ground, touching down and stepping back up, uh, which is like a VMO exercise that I do a lot, specifically before long cycle training in order to warm up my left knee. Um, deck squats are obviously all about knees, elevated box squats. The main thing that we're trying to do first is make you, the arch of your foot fire hard, make your knee rotate under load, uh, inside circle, outside circle, pendulum family with kettlebells and clubs, hydro core, then start doing step backs, then start doing step downs, uh, then start building into other patterns. Um, those are the basics of knees. Uh, oh, and you know, at some point you definitely have to do deck squats. Man, have we ever made a video on Hunter's deck squats? I don't think we have. We should do that. We should make a video on Hunter's deck squats. That's a, that's a much more advanced knee thing, but that is the breakdown of what happens if you're doing something like uh, escape and evasion or parkour and you jump over something and you hit the ground and you do a roll and you come up, you come up in like a Hunter's lunge squat. So there should be a Hunter's deck squat. I don't think we ever made a video on that. Uh, Crunchy Wookie, great name. Have you read Oxygen Advantage by Patrick McCowan? I have not. Uh, if somebody could tell me what Oxygen Advantage is about. Uh, you guys need to make me a reading list and a video list. Uh, if anybody's on the Discord, oh, this is also something I want to talk about. Um, make me a giant master list of videos and topics that people want to know about or books that people want to discuss. Um, so that I have a way to direct ideas because I start ideas and then I get distracted by travel or family issues and I kind of lose the thread a little bit. Uh, Kristen Theory, talking about weird skills. Any value in neck strengthening outside of combat sports or motorsports? I mean, there's always value in something like neck strength, neck strengthening, uh, but it is super important for combat sports, getting hit and for motorsports, shock load and turning your head and holding your head at weird angles. Um, I think that there is value in it. Um, an easy thing to do is to use, what's our halo thing that I have out in the back of the truck? Uh, iron neck, is that what it is? Um, and doing your neck mobility with it every day. It's a fast way to do it in three minutes. Is there value in it? Yes. Is it necessary for absolutely everybody? No. If you're young and you're healthy and you club and you do sport, probably not. As you get older, probably becomes more important. Uh, Albert... Saf, Safstrom, Safstrom, in his Tetris of Training, let me read it in his voice, Albert's voice. In Albert's Texas of Tetris of Training, Albert has access to a barbell gym in addition to club and mace. What would be good complementary barbell exercises? All the Olympic lifts. Um, the only one that I don't see a point in for your average individual is back squat. Uh, deadlift, obviously awesome. If you have a place to do it and you, you know, have the weights to do it, it's just expensive to do at home. And most people can't do it if they don't own their own home or they don't have a barn to Olympic lift in. Um, there's a reason there's usually only one or two deadlift stations in a big box gym is because if you had 80 deadlift stations, you would shake the building apart. Um, uh, so that's why tens, uh, CrossFit gyms are always in industrial areas for the most part, uh, because that many people dropping barbells will shake buildings. There's a CrossFit gym in New York City, right by the Soho Hotel, maybe south, 
south, maybe east south, uh, down from the cro from from the Bowery Hotel, and like you're not even allowed to drop a barbell in there. And it, the gym's in the basement. It's underground on the bottom floor. And if you drop, you'll shake the whole building. People in the whole building know. Um, deadlifting is great. I mean, obviously, hang cleans, power cleans, dead cleans, super, super important. Uh, if you know, you're a university athlete or a football player or something, you're going to be doing those, those exercises forever. Uh, the problem is that you drop the bar when you do that. And if you drop a 200, 300, 400 pound bar, everybody will know. Um, I do actually, I went back and started doing some bench with uh, JP at Gumbate Fitness. Um, I'm going to sneeze. I got a nose full of, <clears throat> pardon me. <clears throat> I think deadlift and power clean are probably your most important. Uh, I would try to leave something like front squat at something like kettlebells. I think the kettlebell front squat just has better overall dynamics than the barbell front squat. But whichever one you have access to, you need to do one version of those squats or, you know, a round stone squat. But I would throw in bench press because it's fun for the most part. If you're doing kettlebells or clubs, then you'll be hitting your shoulders at all the other angles. You know, if you really want to like look good, throw in that 30 minutes of bench press where you do a set every three minutes and you just hit high numbers, three to five reps uh, or 30 seconds um, and have a two and a half minute break. Um, if you have a barbell gym and they're teaching, you know, Olympic, definitely go. Like you'll learn a bunch of stuff. Like Olympic is crazy. Uh, it just takes a long time, which is why I don't talk about it much. Kettlebells are a faster version of Olympic lifting. You know, I have a bunch of friends who are competitive Olympic lifters and their workouts are two hours, hour and a half every day. And that's just, they're not even doing Metcon. It's just the barbell part. You know, they're doing a set every four to five minutes. And then they're going through five of each one of these building exercises. And it's, it's long. It's long. If you're going to a gym that they can cut that down into a shorter time frame, fantastic. Go. Uh, and if you're combining it with club and mace, it's going to work out. All the barbell straight line stuff will be countered by the rotation of club and mace. It can't fail to work out. What's my personal opinion on deadlifts? Aztec Aaron Z. I like them. Um, I prefer a sandbag deadlift myself, um, but that's just me. I'm, I don't have a place to put barbells. I just like sandbag deadlifts more. Uh, but I think barbell deadlift is a fantastic exercise. If you were to do one barbell exercise, probably make it the deadlift or the clean. Um, clean if you just want to hit people super duper ridiculously hard. Um, and deadlift if, you know, for everybody else. Any thoughts on resistance breathing devices? Andrew Myers. He's been using an O2 trainer for a few months and I think, and he thinks it's helping conditioning. The O2 trainer, that's the box. They come in green or blue from Bass Rutin, I think. I think that thing's fantastic. Uh, I have one somewhere. It's buried. Uh, I bought it to help train an actor for something. And we were just having him do his light day where he was doing endurance kettlebelling with that in. It does make you suck in air more. I was not using it the way that's advocated at all. I don't recommend you do that. Um, but yeah, I think it's great. I think it's fantastic. That's one of those weird breathing Kung Fu skills. Like, uh, somebody commented, and I didn't get a chance to talk about it. Uh, Kung Fu just, does just mean like hard work. Um, hard work usually specific to something. So you can have like great Kung Fu at cooking. You can have great Kung Fu at painting. Uh, we just tend to think of Kung Fu in relation to personal defense or fighting. But it could be Kung Fu at ring fighting. It could be Kung Fu at all types of stuff. Uh, the one thing that I, I've always looked at is Kung Fu throughout history. Um, and it's been a great inspiration, obviously, in my life. Uh, because Kung Fu, 
there was no gyms when they invented that stuff. It was just a bunch of people living on the edge of a mountain and they lifted rocks and they swung weapons and they had big maces and they made all their own stuff. But they also did all kinds of great things like breath control training, which is not taught, you know, to Westerners. I mean, it's barely taught in the East anymore. Um, so something like the O2 trainer, fantastic. You are working on breath skill, breath tongue, if you want to say it that way. Uh, you guys, uh, TZ, CZ, great name, man. Um, they're going to start a list for us uh, on videos that we would like to make, books, reading things products, all that stuff. Thank you, CZ. I think I'm saying that right, CZ. Uh, Dale Everdale, had an orthopedic doctor and a major league baseball's umpire trainer look at my knees to tell me my problem. Nobody ever asked if I was pointing my feet forward. They never do. Um, I don't know why nobody talks about that. It's because uh, Europeans think that your feet are supposed to turn out, and that is a holdover from ballet, as far as I can tell. Ballet was originally invented by French nobles for men, for men to look cooler than the poor people, the serfs. So they invented a whole style of training to stand and to move elegantly throughout rooms and to stab people, specifically probably poor people and look good while doing so. That was the original thing of ballet. And that's where we get lots of our turnout stuff. It also comes from European footwear and all kinds of other things. Uh, you'll read about this once again in early accounts of um, the settling of North America by Europeans. And you, can, you could tell even though both Natives and Europeans were wearing moccasins for a lot of the time because moccasins were cheap and you could make them yourself. You, you hunted animals, you made them yourself. You could usually tell European tracks because they turned out. I don't know why. Um, natives pointed their feet straight ahead. Um, in almost every native culture, they point their feet straight ahead that I know about in North America. I don't know about ones in Australia or anything. Um, but ballet is this big carryover, and it's been going over for years. It was originally a bunch of rich people, um, rich men, and then they kind of got lazy and rich, and they didn't really want to do it that much anymore, and they got a little, you know, they started to fall, do that downward royalty slide thing, and then they started making, you know, girls do it to, to entertain them. It was originally the poor girls, they would train them to entertain the rich guys, um, and then, you know, richer uh, girls picked it up. For the same reason guys picked it up. It was a way to make sure that you looked elegant when you walked into a room. Think about that. You're the lord of the land and you own all the property and all the poor people congregate in the pub. Uh, you go into the pub and everybody should know you just by the way you walk in and stand. Like that was the original point of ballet. And then, you know, stabbing people artfully. Um, artfully stabbing people. Started with... All kinds, you know, went into small sword, back sword, but you know, it ended up with small sword, as far as I know. Um, then they kind of, you know, threw it out. It's the same way dressage and horseback riding uh, was originally like. I don't know if you guys are familiar with dressage and horseback riding, but there's all these levels, and it's basically ballet for horses. It's getting horses to look super cool and snappy. It's not running the fastest. It's not jumping the highest. It's just looking super cool, so everybody knows that you're important. That's what dressage is. It was a way of training noble people in a small space in like a castle yard, you know, inside the walls to work on their horsemanship and their horse skills so that they went out, all the poor people would know that, you know, they were the important people. Randall Davis, there he is, Red Forest Chinese Boxing. Randall Davis, Red Forest is one of my favorite uh, guys. We are always talking on Instagram and trading back and forth Kung Fu stuff. Um, we talk about Kung Fu all the time. Um, he's, uh, does like three major martial arts and he does a bunch of other little ones. Um, so we, we'd super nerd out on weird martial arts stuff. <clears throat> uh, Optimus Prime, but spelled like rhyme. Uh, how many miles of walking 
per week would you consider a productive productive amount to counteract counteract a sedentary job sorry guys you guys are starting to hear my speech impediments coming out left right and center here how many miles of walking per week would i recommend uh i would recommend 45 minutes three times a week um plus swings plus some club or some mace uh the problem with sedentary jobs is you sit down your glutes shut off for the most part, the longer you sit, the more your glutes go to sleep, your hip flexors get tight, it deviates your spine. Uh, the kettlebells and the clubs will try to turn your glutes back on. You could get down to doing 10 minutes of those things a day and then walking for 45 minutes um, and you know restore a lot of the stuff that's being destroyed by a sedentary job. Um, so however far you go, you know, set a timer, walk out for 22 minutes when the bell rings, turn around, walk back. Uh, walk a little further each time, drop a rock or something, paint it, paint it a color you can see. Uh, Christian theory, 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 theory. Uh, talking about arc grip exercises, they feel super martial art like. They are. I totally copied them directly from long handled. Uh, Japanese sword stance, one hand high, one hand low, right? Uh, in Japanese sword, the correct length of handle should be the top of your hand underneath the suba and the bottom of your hand, that should be the length. All the copy swords that you get for the most part have really short handles, usually 10 inches or so, but mine are like 14 inches. If you buy them from a company, um, I buy cold steel ones. They are too heavy, I know, but they're indestructible and they're a different type of metal. You can side load them. Um, so like a normal Japanese sword is only strong one direction, edge on, because of the way that they uh, made the steel, because of the quality of metal that they had available to them. They folded metal and then the uh, edge on it, it's all cloudy. That was a clay line so the back of the sword was covered in clay back of the sword yeah back of the sword was covered in clay and then it was pushed up off of the edge and it made this wave pattern there's names for all these different wave patterns from different times in history and it was a part of the art of making swords uh so the edge was hard but the back was soft um so that they were hard this way and they flexed this way but they are not meant to flex this way, like say a European saber is. Um, why was I talking about this? I has something to do with hand. Um, but yeah, handles, handles should be really long on something like that. And so what I was trying to do with arc was mimic some of those setups into the even longer handled ones. Uh, there's a type of Japanese sword and there's a type of this sword all throughout Asia, the Horus Cutter, which has a blade and a handle length about equally the same. So you can get a maximum amount of leverage. Um, and then it eventually turns into something like pole arms with a shorter blade up top and an even longer handle. In Japanese, that would be leaning towards Naginata. But there are shorter versions that you can actually run with in you know, most Asian martial arts. Uh, wow, we're just getting super nerdy over here. <clears throat> uh daniel brooke gandhi hi from yorkshire england hello what are your thoughts on auto regulated rest programs like dry fighting weights i'm not familiar with this program if somebody will add that to the discord list and uh i'll look it up i don't know um auto regulated rest periods is what i tend to do um if you are I think we put up a video today where we had like a big program. It was super dope program design, Poor Man's Paradise. Um, Don Elisald made it. Um, and he had three weeks of work, one week of rest. I tend to just go until I travel. And my travel is my auto-regulated rest. Um, I don't know if that's the same topic as dry fighting weight. Um, but I guess I will find out. Uh, people, Kelly Warren is concerned about aging. Yes, aging is a loss of complexity of the systems in your body over time. There is, of course, cellular aging, where your, uh, 
what is it? Your telomeres get shorter as your cells continue to reproduce. And over time, you end up getting more errors inside your genetic code from the way that it's reproducing. Um, but if we want to think about it from a training perspective and not from like some nerdy biology perspective, uh, aging is the loss of movement patterns and complexity. This is why I harp on movement patterns and complexity. Um, usually aging comes from like a cumulative injury cycle. So people have a real age, like a genetic age, and they have an apparent age. So like, you know, a lot of 22 year olds today are actually at like a 60 year old physical age because they just never learned to move and they sat down so long that they've never de developed movement patterns. Um, if you're going to fight aging, side effect, or side note, we're telling you how to do it every day. It's, in, it's maintaining an ability to learn increasingly complex movements forever. So the way that they used to do anti-aging for a lot of human history was like fancy Indian club swinging. Um, and fancy Indian club swinging, a weight in each hand, light weights usually, and they would swing in different patterns forever. Uh, and then, you know, the British got a hold of it and they kind of did it in a ballet stance and they kept doing it, but they kind of lost a lot of the cool stepping patterns associated with like Kung Fu. Um, what you're seeing now is I think fantastic with stuff like steel mace flow, like steel mace flow is just anti-aging is an entire strategy. It's infinitely complex. It has all the stepping patterns and you just keep going and it's time under tension. Um, as far as good anti-aging strategies go, that's probably one of the best ones. In order to get there, I talk about how to get there. So I think of something like steel mace flow is like top 10%. I think of what I do is, is zero to 90. That's what I'm always trying to do. Take people from absolute zero, build each individual skill as it goes up, get people to stand all the way up, get people to rotate, then introduce stepping patterns. Then people can go uh towards um things like steel mace flow which are specifically anti-aging they mimic anti-aging strategies throughout history uh in the classical sense of like asian martial arts all of shaolin is an anti-aging strategy the movements the forms that you're supposed to practice in asian martial arts not really japanese not really Japanese, but like the rest of them, specifically the Chinese arts, Northern and Southern, those are all anti-aging strategies. Um, they're, think of them as CrossFit from a thousand years ago uh, with less beat up, with less, with less things that get you killed. Um, uh, classic anti-aging martial arts, Tai Chi, Bagua, Jing Yi, uh, of those, you know, Tai Chi and Bagua probably have some of the cooler stepping patterns in it. Jing Yi is a little bit more focused on mind, form, fist, and tension. Um, I'm sure somebody will tell me if I said that wrong. But uh, anti-aging strategy, 100% building up towards not putting a weight down for 20 to 30 minutes with an intermediate weight and an intermediate amount of complexity and an infinite number of stepping patterns. Yeah, I think I said that right. And of course, you need to lift super heavy things like twice, two, three times a week. Uh, that would be, could be kettlebells, but it could also just be round sandbags. Um, doing a set of three round sandbag uh, it has the same um, purpose as like doing deadlift with a barbell, but doing it with a sandbag is more complex, more natural movement than a barbell is. People are gonna yell at me about that, but it is true. <clears throat> Any books you think everyone ought to have? Jesse Scarborough. Um, Vector Prime by Ari Salvatore. But boy, you got to be a Star Wars nerd to really like that. That's what should have happened in the Star Wars universe. They should have done what Vector Prime started, and they didn't. They completely thrashed it, and I'll never forgive Disney for what they did to the greatest story ever told, which starts with Vector Prime. Uh, it's a 20 book series. It's basically Lord of the Rings in the Star Wars universe. Um, yeah, and yes, you're a huge nerd. Other books everybody should have. Uh, you should have all of the classics of philosophy, you know, um, and religion throughout history. You should have the Bible. You should have the Torah. You should have 
the Quran. You should have the Analects of Confucius. You should have the Bhagavad Gita. You should have um, the Way, the Tao. Um, which ones am I missing? Somebody tell me which classics I'm missing. Um, uh, you should understand those because if you don't understand those, you really don't understand the flow of history, which has been modified by the philosophies that come from those different things. Um, there's some great stuff uh, that, uh, about... I mean, we could do a whole series of talks just about the evolution of the concept of Dharma and Zen throughout history, but that is like way, way too far for me to put on YouTube. I don't even know how I talk about that without getting murdered. Some, there would be some history professor who would tell me that my understanding is totally wrong. Um, uh, Steve Perwin. A few months ago, he threw out his back badly, and he's still dealing with some pain and sciatica. Any tips on recovery and prevention of re-injury? Um, to the end of club. Um, balance out the rotations of your body 100%. Um, swinging weight, everything we do is about back, it's about knees, and it's about recovery, uh, 100%. Um, straight lines, get rid of them. Uh, rotating about the central axis changes the length tension relationship to the muscles in your spine, and then those muscles wrap around the back of your hips into your glutes and into the outside of your leg and run down your leg. Um, yeah, you just reinstitute rotation and work on your standing structure again. Start with a light weight. If you were injured, you drop all the way back down to a 10 pound club and you start over. Uh, probably also so as stretch. Usually when people pull their back, they lift their rib cage and their so as contracts, muscle connecting the front of their hip to the back of their body. It contracts. It's characterized by a very, very arched spine. If one side is lifted higher than the other, then you've you've tweaked up one side. Uh, usually people have to, um, some people have to go get something like body work to work on the releasing of the psoas. Uh, but you can also use something like a so right. It's just very annoying. Uh, it's very annoying to do yourself, but it is necessary. And then reinstituting rotation. Uh, two hand club, single arm club. Um, probably drop mace for now because the complexity and the shock load of the catch can tweak people up, you know? Uh, but you can put mace back in later after you're no longer in pain. Gold cat just yelled nerd at me. Yes, I am a nerd. <clears throat> Evan Young thinks he overdid it with club bell training. One training day of, where'd it go? Of heavier weight seems to have hurt my hands. My hands are stiffer in the morning and after grip actively, and I'm worried about it worsening. Uh, there is some crazy stuff that happens to people's hands in the beginning with club training when they jump weight. One of the things is the muscles in between here get trashed. If the weight's really heavy and you're not able to solidify your hand to make it rigid, your hand will collapse and it will cause your hand to feel terrible for about a week. And then you have to work on a lower number of reps and focus on squeezing until this hand broadens back out. It is a weird thing, but that is something that happens when people aren't holding tight enough, their hand will compress and it will absolutely thrash them. Um, so yes, maybe start with a lower jump, but you are gonna have to take some time off or just jump programs for a couple of weeks and do something that pulls against your grip instead of pulling through your grip or crushing your grip vertically like a club pulls through your grip or pushes down through your grip change to a kettlebell program for a couple of weeks then come back then try to make your jumps sh smaller try to make your jumps smaller or do a smaller number of reps drop time under tension is an idea do the same movements but say just do three reps and let your hand strengthen up people do not quite get how much adaptation your hands have to do in order to do something like kettlebells and clubs. When you jump up in clubs, it can be very, very hard on your hands. It can be hard on your elbows. There's a lot of stuff. That is why we always talk about uh, long periods of time with this stuff.
Uh, oh, Roman Stoicism. Thanks, Gold Cat. Uh, he comments a lot. He's got a lot of good comments. Um, Taoism, st Stoicism, Buddhism, obviously, Sufism. Yeah, uh, there are a lot of very consistent ideas in all of those things. Uh, Matt Marciano, have, have I ever worked with drummers? No, I've worked with a lot of fire performers. Uh, I knew a whole drumming group, but nobody ever wanted to train. They're musicians. I mean, they also wanted to do was drink and uh, play drums. Um, Mark, 2025. Okay, good name. How much weight for farmers carry distance to cover? Senior age group. I mean, think, think 50 yards short, 100 yards medium, 200 yards probably long. Um, if you want to get crazy, 400. Um, if you're in the senior category, probably don't go above, say, 24K. Um, shorter distance, heavier weight. Um, you could do a 10-yard carry with 100 pounders. But once again, that's going to be super hard on you. Um, I tend to lean more towards distance and lighter weights because that's more what I have access to. But you can stack up big heavy weights and you could do, like, super heavy Kettlebell deadlift, walk 10 yards, set it down, wait a minute, do it again. There's so many ways to do that. Um, and that's all just based on strength, uh, based on how many other programs you have. Um, I tend to put farmer's walks a little bit later in training. I want to make sure people's ankles, knees, and hips are strong first. Uh, and I So lots of swings, lots of clean and press first, lots of clubs. That way I'm sure that their shoulders aren't going to just traction right out of the socket. Um, Chris Wilson, Voltaire's Candid, Plato's Allegory of the Cave, Stephen Crane's The Open Boat. Oh, now you're just getting into deep, deep philosophy. Okay. Randy Allen, are you the only one who lost the feed? Uh, I think so. I think everybody else is still commenting. Any plans to talk to Mike Fitch, the creator of Animal Flow, from Blink Owl? Uh, Mike Fitch is a great guy. He's a great dude. Um, I really like the community he's created. I love his classes. I've taken level one and level two. Um, they're super fun. Um, I love Mike Fitch. He's a great dude. Um, I had dinner with him, I don't know, a couple years ago uh, after one of his seminars. Fantastic, fun to talk to. I really like his philosophy. Uh, what he was doing was just traveling the world in a circle and he would go for three months to one area and Airbnb and then go to another area in Airbnb. And he was just uh, jumping and doing seminars every weekend and then exploring in the middle. Boom, beautiful, lovely adventure life strategy. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, super cool guy. Um, they do a lot of follow along stuff on their animal flow group. My friend, Tara Scott, who is my friend, and we, we think that we're kind of the same, but I'm 6'2", and she's like 5'2". We're really funny when we stand next to each other because we we known each other for so long. We banter back and forth, and everybody always thinks it's weird looking. Uh, there are some pictures of us at Animal Flow seminars where I'm, I look like a, t t like a giant compared to her. She looks like a normal person. I look like a giant. Um, she does Animal Flow all the time. Um, when I'm in LA, we talk about animal flow. They do follow along work series every week. The problem with it is that over time, the complexity of animal flow has gone up so far that a lot of it's, it's harder for people to start because the complexity of the advanced individuals has gotten so high. That tends to be an issue that I see with every one of the flow-based communities, whether it be animal flow or mace or fire performers. Uh, the really advanced people who are five to seven years in, five to 10 years in, ha usually have a hard time going back down or they don't wanna go back down for the newbies. Um, my body weight programs will be an intro essentially to animal flow uh, because it's all based on quadruped get ups, but it is less based on quadruped ambulation, quadruped moving across the ground. Uh, 
because for the most part, a lot of people don't have access to that. If you do, it's absolutely fantastic. Go do Animal Flow, super fun. I would love to do Animal Flow. There's a girl, Venus Lau, girl, woman, instructor, coach, Venus Lau, uh, forgive my language, um, out by Venice. She's absolutely fantastic. Uh, I love to watch her uh, Instagram and I've known her for years and I love the way she does animal flow and they used to do it in the park. I don't know what's going on post COVID anymore, but I would love to have time in my life to go take an animal flow class three days a week. That would be super fun. I just don't have that much time. Mm, how should one progress with kettlebells? How many years to spend with single kettlebell? How long with doubles? Uh, I tell everybody to spend at least two years with single, single kettlebell because you need to do a two-year swing program. Um, uh, when you go to doubles, you double the load. Uh, and most people, uh, it used to be really hard on people because they were fixed weights. Now with the competition adjustable kettlebells, I think that, that problem will probably go away because you can get up to single arm 24 for clean and press and then go back down to double 12 for clean and press and have the same amount of load on your hips um, and then walk that up. It used to be a much bigger issue, but I told people to do single arm for two to three years usually. Uh, usually, unless they come from like a barbell perspective. Barbell guys you're already perfect at straight lines. So sure, go to doubles. Um, but barbell guys should probably do single because they're already good at symmetrical movement. Single kettlebell is the thing. It's separate from everything else. If you're doing doubles, you're essentially recreating barbell. If you're doing single, you're doing something else. You're doing something different. Um, so I tell people two to three years minimum, you can get away with doing single for 10 years. Uh, and never do double. Uh, I'm doing double now because I finally have double competition adjustable kettlebells and I can take it with me for the first time ever. In 15 years, I can actually take 270 pound weights and have all the weights. So I'm doing double long cycle now because it's super fun. And I really want to be like that one guy on Instagram who does that, that world champion guy. That guy's crazy. Um, can't remember his name. Uh, I think he's from the Orange Kettlebell Club. Um, yeah, I think that that's a great idea. Uh, sticking with single arm for a long time. Because if you go to a gym, you do symmetrical. If you uh, go to CrossFit, you do symmetrical. If you go uh, to a big box gym, all the machines are symmetrical. Um, everything's really set up. 99% of the stuff out there is symmetrical. Most med ball is symmetrical. So I tell people to stick to single arm kettlebelling for a long time because then it pushes it into an outlier. And it, just by doing anything with single arm, you will accidentally fill holes in your training from absolutely everything else, everything else. Um, oh man, Peter Osborne, sprint canoe kayak question. Any recommendations for training to support sprint canoe kayak? He races C1 and he's worried about developing an imbalance on my offside. Huge problem with boat stuff. Uh, even with rowers, wherever your position is in the boat, you tend to always be pulling to one side because they tend not to move you to another spot where you could pull on the other side. Uh, yeah, if you're, you're gonna have to convince your... Uh, team are you doing singles or i can't remember what c1 is is c1 team canoe or is it single canoe um you need to train an equal and opposite amount on the other side um people don't want to do that it's the same way they don't want to do it in gymnastics they don't want to do it in circus do it anyway don't listen to anybody else do it anyway you will develop a strength and balance and you'll kind of twist and you'll do all kinds of weird stuff and usually the better you get, the worse that twist will become. And it'll be great for five years. Um, and then eventually you'll be really old because you're building in an aging thing 
into training. Always pulling on one side is building in an imbalance. And if you're competitive, you're going to build it in even harder and you're going to get all your injuries on one side. Uh, so please, please spend an equal amount of sprint sets on the other side. Uh, not too bad gamers. Would you ever go on Kettlebelt Knights podcast? Don't know anything about it. I'll ha somebody will have to send it to me. Um, with Gregory at Lebe, 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 Lebe Stark. Lebe, Lebe Stark. Um, I would love to see a collab. I, yeah, I just don't know what that is. Um, oh, Lebe Stark, he made a video about me like last year or something. It was a long video. Um, I don't know what the point of the video was. Uh, sure. I mean, why not? I'll talk to anybody. I love to talk to people. That's how you learn. Talking to people is how you learn. Um, Clifford, Colin Clifford, Colin Clifford, uh, has an 8X club. Should you get the arc next mace or weight add one for club as I get stronger? Uh, you need to do single arm club if you're a dude until you get to at least single arm 25 and you can do 10 sets of 10 of all of your core exercises, uh, up to mill and reverse mill for sure. Um, it's kind of a toss up whether you go to mace or arc. I think arc probably has more movement capacity in it now, and it mimics a lot of the stuff that mace does. Um, but it, that's a toss up. I would say arc. I'm going to say arc. Um, I'm going to say arc. I'm going to say arc. Just because you can do the cool separate high hand circles and inside circles, which are a little bit more difficult with mace. Uh, but that is a totally different type of rotation that's pretty awesome, especially if you do any type of combat sport. Thoughts on HKC from Dan John. Uh, I heart, HKC, that's not the armor building complex, not the ABC, HKC. Somebody's got to tell me what HKC from Dan John is. Uh, I'm unfamiliar with it. Uh, Dan John's ABC's armor building complex is absolutely sheer genius. And if I know nothing else about Dan John, which I really don't, I'm sorry. I know that I'm supposed to keep track of everybody, but I can't. Um, his armor building complex is like sheer genius. Simplicity. Uh, it's everything. It's everything all rolled up into one thing. It's fantastic. Do you wear socks when wearing training shoes? Just got my fadeaways and I don't know if you want to wear socks or not. Sure, wear socks. Get some of the ultra low uh, Moreno wool socks. Um, it'll just keep them from rubbing on your pinky toe. A lot of people get rubbing on their pinky toe with fadeaways. Uh, yeah, I would say definitely wear them if you can. Um, the great thing about fadeaways is you can throw them in the washing machine and wash them. Uh, Andrew Lofts. Uh, hi, Mark. Uh, Andrew is from London. He has been training single arm heavy club six months using 10 kilograms. That's 22 pounds. It's a little heavy, probably. Uh, left hand mill, still clunky and awkward. Right hand mill and reverse mill, both sides smooth. Um, yeah, drop weight. Any suggestions? Drop weight. Um, if one thing is still, nobody wants to drop weight, but you should all drop weight, guys. Um, your range, uh, let's say eight, seven, let's say your range if in the UK being say seven to 12 K 15 to 25 pounds, you guys are going to use that forever and you're going to bounce up and down between the weights, heavyweight, lightweight, heavyweight, lightweight, heavyweight, lightweight. Um, you learn a lot from jumping back and forth between the weights. If something's not smooth, go back down to the lightweight, figure out what's different what part of the movement is it and you know master it with a lightweight then go back to the heavyweight that's why we talk about light heavy all the time if you do light heavy with all of this stuff you will accidentally teach yourself all the stuff that i would ever tell you uh dennis vasilev that's the name that's the guy 
uh, from Orange Kettlebell Club, whose long cycle is like poetry. It's a thing of beauty. Uh, if I ever get to the point where I look that cool, I would be super duper excited with myself. Um, that guy is a complete and utter savage monster with kettlebells. Um, and we should all be shooting for what that guy can do. Uh, he's just an absolute monster. Um, he's got that, that perfect kettlebell build. He's not big. He's long. He's lean. He's just carved out of stone and his quads are the size of your head. Uh, awesome. Um, there's another guy I always watch as well who's doing a giant jerk cycle right now. Got to remember that guy's name. And his jerks are very good. And he's a big dude. Um, I can't remember that gentleman's name. He's on a jerk cycle right now. I watch it all the time on Instagram. Well, I do more videos on kettlebell juggling. Somebody make me a list. I don't know what I've done and not done anymore. I've made like 800 videos. Uh, I am completely unclear on what topics I've covered if you guys on the Discord want to make me a list of like all the kettlebell videos I've made and all the juggling videos and break them up in as many ways as you can, I can then look at those lists and then find out what topic I need to talk about in between all the other things. I would love that. I just don't have time to sit down. When I started, I just started making videos and I was not keeping thorough records. My fault. Um, so I'm not really clear on what I've done. Um, I also would like to go back and make a lot of the basic videos over again in like a more clear order, kind of like I did with Mace and then number them. Maybe I'll do like kettlebell one to 100 and redo them in an order. Cause before I was just having fun and talking about things that I wanted to talk about and talking about things in the order that I wanted to talk about them then, but the idea was much smaller. Now that the idea is really big, I should probably redo all of it better. Uh, hard style kettlebell challenge, HKC, Dan John. I thought HKC was the name of a seminar. Uh, they had RKC, which was a three day seminar. HKC was just a one day seminar, but that was years ago and I have no idea, um, no idea what the HKC is now. Hard style kettlebell challenge. Is that the thing? Now that used to be, they used to have one where you did deadlift, pull up and snatch or something like that. Um, that was a great idea. That was an old Pavel idea. I don't know what Dan John's idea is. Uh, Nori Kaneko. Kaneko. Nori Kaneko, Japanese name. Do you know... Amy McGuire, Army McGuire, old school martial arts, carnival guy, elephant trainer. I do not, I do not know Army McGuire. Great name though. And good name, Nori Kaneko. Uh, haven't worked on my Japanese in a long time. Uh, Zach Bracker, Breaker, Bracker, Bracker. I got to get some kind of, some way to understand how to say people's names. Locust stretch. I see you have mentioned this several times recently, but I can't find any example video in your warm up or cool down section. Have you done any video on that? I've missed. Yeah, I think I made like three videos on a rooftop in LA. Single arm elbow stretch. I think I might have just called it elbow stretch instead of locust. Uh, lie down, chest towards the ground, roll to one side, take your hand, palm facing away from your body, elbow. Uh, towards your belly button, underneath your hip, roll over, flatten out, press your elbow into the ground. That is the single arm version that most people need after something like um, a quadruped seal stretch, quadruped seal or up dog seal. Think up dog where you spin your hands around is usually elbow stretch number one. Then single arm locust stretch, which is very intense for anybody who's ever done weightlifting. And then there's a double arm version of it, which is absolutely savage. And then the full yoga version is the two arms with the legs curling up towards the back of the head, which I don't know anybody who does who's not like a vegan waif person. Um, I just, uh, so yes, there are some videos on it. I think there's two or three videos in the cool down videos. I don't remember what numbers they are. Uh, what weight range for kettlebells would you recommend for the average person? 12 to 32. Yes, that's it. Is there any benefit of going up beyond 32 if your main goal is general physical preparedness? I don't think so. I used to think so because we all used to think we needed to lift 48K. But 
Um, kettlebell lifting, as we kind of know it from the sports style, kind of maxes out at 32K. I know that they have heavier categories now, but for years, that was, that was it, you know. Uh, double 24 Ks, 50 pounds in each hands. That's two bags of grain, man. Those are the weights you are likely to use in the real world. And if you get good at lifting those for a longer period of time, you'll be better off. Double 70s puts you at 140 pounds. If you can lift 140 pounds for 10 minutes, I think you're killing it. Um, getting above that just costs a lot of money. It, can you do it? Absolutely. Do I see a massive need for it? I do not. I used to think so. Um, I don't think that anymore. The older I get, the more I'm like, wow, it was just, it was bravado and youth that made us want to lift that stuff. Uh, but we really only ended up lifting it. We turned it back into pure strength training. We turned it into single side barbell training, which is super valuable. You can totally do that. If you have the money to do it and you have the space for the bells, you buy the bells once they don't go bad, you're going to have them forever. So if you buy them and you have a place to put them, go for it. Absolutely. Um, is it necessary? I don't think so. I don't think so. I do think that kettlebells separate themselves from Olympic lifting by going for longer sets. If you can just pick up 270s for even a five minute set, I think that that is a better use of your time, but that is just me. I used to lift the 44s um, and all that other stuff. I have 48s. I did have 48s, they're now at Combate Fitness in Los Angeles, uh, cause they're super hard to move around. I'm just gonna buy new ones in Ohio. Um, yeah, they're super cool. I just don't see a general need for it to be that heavy. I think two adjustable competition kettlebells is the absolute best possible money you could uh, ever spend. I think that that's the best money you could ever spend in conjunction with the ARC, uh, the 8X Club and ARC. Um... Naba183, starting with a 12K kettlebell. Now I'm working with a 20 and a 24 kettlebell. Can you suggest more double kettlebell exercises with non-symmetric weights? You can do all the exercises with non-symmetric weights. Just be aware that it is going to torque your spine up more on one side than the other. So you need to make sure you're doing an equal number of sets with each heavy, with the heavy on each side. Um, yeah, there are some other kettlebells. Uh, Great Lakes Gear started making these giant kettlebells, monster bells. Rogue originally did this years ago, but they were so expensive. Uh, and they had like small handles on them. Um, I think they've, they've all redesigned to have enough uh, handle for you to actually get two full hands on the bell without your pinkers sticking out or without over lacing your fingers. Um, if you could get your hands on some monster bells and just leave them outside and do swings with super heavy bells, fantastic idea. Fully replace the deadlift at that point with the kettlebell deadlift. You know, they have 100 kilogram kettlebells now. You could deadlift that, and then if you can even start to swing that a little bit, that's amazing. Um, but is it necessary? I don't think so if you just wanna be a healthy, normal, generally physically prepared person. If you want to, you know, beat up a giant, then probably, I don't know. Brock Brown, trail running versus trail running versus rucking. Which is more efficient at building athleticism? Which would you recommend for a young male in the mountains of with low cardio endurance? What's their beginner program for each? Uh, the answer, Brock, is both. Um, if you want, if you have low cardio endurance, and let's be honest, all of us have low cardio endurance, unless you are a distance runner or um, or like a long-term cyclist, long-distance cyclist, uh, you should do both. I would say ruck twice a week, trail run twice a week. Um, start your trail running, uh, depending on where you're at in the world. Uh, if you can run off trail, that's even better, but that's probably really hard in the beginning. Um, running on trail is fantastic. Set a timer, start with five minute run away from the starting point turn around, run back. Same thing with rucking. Um, <clears throat> start the rucking probably three weeks ahead 
so that the rucking would be several minutes longer than the trail running. That's a super cheap, easy way to get it done. Um, start the rucking and go do it for a month and then introduce the trail running. Um, rucking equipment, I, sorry, uh, rucking equipment. Man, there's a lot of stuff. Uh, my favorite would be like an old Alice pack frame with a rubber trash can, uh, trucker, trucker, trucker straps to it. Those black rubber trucker straps around the frame connecting the bucket of like a rubber made trash can onto the top of the ledge of an Alice pack. And then you can adjust your weights really easy rucking. You can just throw in bricks or sand or whatever you have, and you can make them adjustable by weight, five bricks pull out two bricks, you know, you can, and then make sandbags to just drop in there. It goes in and out really fast. Um, if you're not doing something fancy, fancy, like the go ruck bags, uh, the go ruck bags are, you know, way more money. Uh, so poor man's version, um, Alice pack, uh, start the rucking first, go two to three times a week, probably twice a week. Uh, get maybe four weeks in and then start introducing two days of trail running. That'll put your rucking, if you started at five minutes of rucking away, five minutes of rucking back, the next week would be six minutes or the next workout. So if you do it twice a week in four weeks, you would get eight minutes up. It would be 13 minutes out, 13 minutes back for rucking. And then you would start the trail running and you would just build up towards 30 minutes out, 30 minutes back. Um, and then the, the trail running would catch up. Yeah, that would work. So let's let's say that again. I don't think I said that that clear. Start the rucking ahead of time. Do it twice a week. Let your joints and your legs and your body adapt. Start with five minutes out, turn around, bell goes off, walk five minutes back. Add a minute each workout, which will actually add two minutes because it's an extra minute out, an extra minute back. So you would go from 10 minutes to 12 minutes to 14 minutes to 16 minutes to 18 minutes. Um, and you would build up that way. And then your rucking should take more time than your trail running. Start your trail running. When your trail running gets to maybe 20 minutes out and 20 minutes back, uh, and you're building towards the 30 minutes out, 30 minutes back, um, start introducing load. Maybe if you already do kettlebells, clubs, or mace, then you can introduce load. Um, something light, five pounds, uh, and start carrying it in one hand. Great idea. Uh, good question, Brock. All right, guys, we are just about at 90 minutes here. Let's do, uh, let's do one more. Uh, let's find a good one. Uh, Christian Thierry. I think we already did a question from him, but he's got a lot of good questions. Are the hard style rounder handle kettlebells inferior in your opinion? I see you just use competition style and support the L of the L to the L of the hand, as you always mention. Um, we all started at hard style. God, I got to stop hitting this thing. Sorry, guys. Um, we all started at hard style. Back in the beginning, we all started with the Dragon Door kettlebells. Um, and they are kind of more of an advocate of just a pure monkey grip, more like a barbell grip in the beginning. Um, I got the competition grip from um, Fedorenko. Fedorenko? Fedorenko. Yeah, that's what it says on the side of my bells. Um, I got that from him when I went to, uh, to his seminars. I did uh, RKC1 and RKC2, like maybe 2005, 2006, something like that. Uh, can't remember anymore, but we all started with those bells. Um, and over time, bells got better. Competition bells, I think, are better. The grip is always consistent with the way you hold. I really like the new competition adjustable bells with the 35 millimeter handles instead of the 33 millimeter handles, which is what I used to have on all of my bells, on my old Fedorenko bells uh, back when it was, God, what did it used to be called? Um, World Kettlebell Club and American Kettlebell Club bells. Um, 
I like the slightly bigger handle, but you really, if you want to lift for a long period of time, that L of the L and the 45 degree across your hand is the only way you're going to do it. If you're catching with the weight up here and the weight running across your hand instead of diagonally to your hand, you are just going to thrash your wrists eventually. Olympic lifters can get away with that because they're lifting one to five at a time. Um, with kettlebells, you're bouncing on that joint hundreds of times. It's just not going to work out. So even the kettlebell guys are, uh, the sport guys are catching up here and going down here. It looks like they're bending their wrist, but they're not. They're moving the upper part of their hand out of the way from the weight sitting directly on top of the bone. And it should be pushing straight down through. If the weight is up here, then you're compressing the back of your wrist. It will hurt. Every, that you, You'll notice it right away if you do that. Um, I just like competition bells better. Um, I still have heart style bells. They're fantastic. They never go bad. They'll be around longer than civilization. I used an old pair of hard style perform better bells, which were these big gnarly handles, but they had a huge window. So they fit my arm really well for years before I got competition bells, probably five years. Um, there's nothing wrong with hard style bells. They tend to work a little bit better for things like juggling. Um, all the early juggling stuff that I knew was all hard style bell. I just like competition bells better now. Uh, it's just, there's nothing against hard style bells. Um, a lot of hard style bells are inconsistent in the window size so they can lay on your wrist poorly. With a competition bell, I know if they're competition bells, I'm gonna pick them up and they're gonna fit my body. With hard style bells from different manufacturers, that is a toss up. You do not know what you are going to get until it shows up. If the handle's a little bit smaller, uh, there might not even be broad enough. That was a problem with bells for a long time, especially the light bells. Um, yeah, competition bells, I just know that they're always going to fit my hands and that I'm always going to be able to lift them the way that I want to lift them. With hard style bells, it could be a complete toss up. Uh, I don't even use much like hard style lower weight bells anymore because they rest right on top of my joint. And that's super annoying. It's not supposed to do that. They're supposed to rest down here off of the joint itself. If they're resting on the back of your hand or on any of this, any of your wrist bones, that is bad. That, that is bad. You should not, you should not do that. Uh, competition bells just more consistently work better. I've not yet seen a competition bell that doesn't fit. The new pro kettlebells that are made in the Dakotas, um, uh, that factory makes a new product called the Iron Warrior, which is super cool, which I'm going to do a box opening on maybe tomorrow. Um, I think they're great. I think that they're the best bells ever made. I've never seen anything like it. They're the Ferrari of kettlebells. Your standard competition bell is great. It's, it, it's a BMW. It works great. Um, yeah, competition bells all the way. I can't think of enough good things to say about consistently. Let me put it this way. I have wasted five, $7,000 on kettlebells that were hard style that sucked that did not fit your arm properly. And it was a waste of time and a waste of money. And those things ended up God knows where. I don't even, didn't even bother keeping track of them. Um, my competition bells, I keep track of. I still have the Fedorenko bells that I got from my first certification with him back in like maybe 07. I, is it 07? It was 07 or 08. Whenever he started making the first USA competition bells uh, because they're always good. They always good. They fit everybody's hand. Maybe if you were six, seven, they wouldn't fit your hand, but I have yet to run into a person that they don't fit. So I think competition bells just because I'm trying to save everybody money and I don't want you guys to do what I did and waste a ton of money on stuff that doesn't actually work. Handles are too small, windows too small, angle is bad, you can't hold it properly, it hurts your arm, it's gonna rip your elbow in half. Um, competition bells always work. 
Uh, thank you guys. Um, we're going to do this again next week. Next week, we are going to try to do an earlier time to try to get more people in from the European cohort. Co I don't know what we're calling. Did anybody ever settle on a name for people who watch this channel? I know people were talking about it. Uh, I don't know. Uh, we're going to try. Um, and yeah, we're going to try and make it earlier so that we can get to European times. So it'll be eight o'clock or five to eight o'clock in most of Europe. Uh, thanks guys very much. Um, yeah, if you guys are interested, join the discord that is run by Grant Gardner. We have dubbed him the Lord of the discord. Uh, seed set, uh, apparently is also part of the discord. Thank you. Seed set. And, uh, yes, everybody have a good day. Do good work, lift weights, go down a road you've never gone down, read a book.